All right. Well, this, this is the first week we're going to uh, do a, a, an overview, an introduction on transformation. It's our third core value here at New Life City. Uh, our first core value is the presence of God. We believed in the presence of God. It's a high priority for us. We believe God's presence is tangible. We believe in prayer. We believe in the power of prayer and that prayer actually changes things, that prayer is effective, that God is, is, is partnering with you in your prayer life. We also believe in transformation, not just behavior modification, but an absolutely changed life that you don't have to continue to live the same way you've always lived, that in Christ Jesus, you are a new creation. And that all that old stuff in your life, all that uh, sinful stuff and the, the, the behavior and the hiccups that keep you from actually being the exact person God wants you to be can actually go away and you can live as a new believer in Jesus. This is like an amazing promise. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, when it comes to transformation, we're going to talk about several different aspects. Uh, we're also going to have several different people discussing and, uh, and, and, and teaching on the subject um, in different kind of facets of transformation. But the, the one thing I want us to understand right from the get-go, I'm not talking about legalism. I'm not talking about church behavior. I'm not saying that if you want to be a good Christian, you have to wear a certain type of shoes or talk a certain way or have a bald head. I'm not saying any of those things, okay? Although you would be more attractive, man, if you did that. Um, but this is not, it's not, it's not something that, that's really conducive in, into, you know, um, the, the way we know how to behave in church. There's a lot of Christians who know how to act church. They know how to do church. They know how to talk the talk. Man, I had friends at work who didn't realize I was a Christian. And when, when they were at work talking to me and talking to others, they talked a certain different way. But when they found out I was a Christian, man, they switched on the, fl the, the they flipped on the switch. And they were like, Oh yeah, I'm above and not beneath. I'm I'm the head and not the tail. You know, they're getting they're just quoting, you know, all the all the great scriptures, but but they're not living the lifestyle. They're not actually living transformed. They just know how to do church. I don't care how you dress. I mean, dress modestly, please. I mean, that's biblical, right? You know, but 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 it's not, it's not in the style of your dress that actually makes you transformed. It's actually what God's doing in your life. And um, John Wimber said something, I'm paraphrasing, I think I'm saying it better, but, but basically he's saying this. He can't defend himself um, <laughs> till heaven, so sorry. That's, I mean, I love John Wimber, I'm, I'm quoting him. I shouldn't have said that, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jesus, help me, sorry. Oh, uh, okay. But this is, getting someone set free um, is one aspect, but showing them how to live a normal Christian life is where the work begins. So uh, obviously, getting someone set free, um, uh, uh, being born again, this is an amazing miracle that God does. This is not anything that you can do in your own accord. But, and, and maybe even some being demonically oppressed I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but there are people uh, who are walking around with such strongholds in their life that they need some, they need God to set them free. But, e but even after, if, if they've lived years of oppression, 10, 15 years of being oppressed, I've seen them get set free, but now they've never known what it was like to be set free. It's almost like if you, if you, if you, um, if, if, if there's anyone who's struggled with alcoholism and you understand the process, there is people who get detoxified, but now they gotta learn how to live a normal Christian life. And that is work. That is where you're partnering with God to do it. Um, there's an amazing uh, real story that happened on January 15th, 2009. A miracle took place in New York. For some people say they... Uh, and they might have been right by calling it a miracle. But the full explanation is anything even more interesting and exciting. And it strikes the note that I think we need as we begin a brief exploration of one of the central topics in what it means to be a Christian. You might have remembered what happened 
Flight 1549 took off from LaGuardia, bound from Charlotte, North Carolina. Two minutes after takeoff, the aircraft ran into a flock of geese. Both engines were badly damaged. They lost power. The plane was then heading north over the Bronx, and instantly the captain, Chelsea Sullenberger, and his co-pilot had to make several major decisions. They could see one or two small airports that weren't very far, but they realized they could not guarantee getting them there. Likewise, putting the plane down on the New Jersey Turnpike, which is a big highway in New Jersey, was probably not going to be easy or safe. That only leaves one option, the Hudson River. It's not easy to crash land safely on water, and within the two minutes that they had, not a long time, before they hit water, the captain and co-pilot had to do a whole lot of host of vital things. Uh, me flying often and um, uh, almost a million miles at, at age 40, uh, I, I've studied a little bit about airplanes, and the two uh, most dangerous times are when the plane is taking off and when the plane is landing. See, when the plane's 30,000 feet in the air, if a problem happens, it can glide, it can do, they can talk to radio towers, there's so many options, but when you're only just a few thousand feet in the air, everything happens quickly. And so here they are with two minutes to spare. So they shut down the engines. They set the right speed of the plane so it could glide as long as possible without power. They had to put the nose of the plane down to maintain speed, but then get it up again before hitting the water. They had to disconnect the autopilot, override the flight management system. They had to activate the ditch system, which seals vents and valves to make the, wa the plane waterproof. And most of all, they had to uh, fly and then glide the plane in a fast, sharp left-hand turn so that they could so that they could come down facing south, going with the flow of the Hudson River. Then they had to straighten the plane up from the tilt so the turn uh, of the turn so that the landing would be exactly level. And then finally, they had to get the nose back up again, but not too far up, to land straight and flat on the water. That is at least the smallest of things, of key things that they had to do in a couple minutes. And there are probably much more things to do than that, but we amateurs could never understand that. So as you know, everyone got off safely. All 155 passengers and so many described the incident as a miracle that on one level, I cannot question that. But to me, the fascinating thing is the whole business, how it spectacularly illustrates a vital truth, a truth which may today have for, been forgotten or never known in the first place. And you could call the power of acquired habits. You might say it's the result of many years of training and experience, but the ancient writers would have called it virtue. Virtue isn't, in this sense, simply another word for goodness. Virtue is what happens when someone has made a thousand small decisions requiring effort and concentration to do something which is good and right and doesn't come naturally. So then on the thousand first time, when it really matters, they find that they do what's needed and it automatically happens. And I wanna talk about virtue, I wanna talk about discipline, I wanna talk about holiness, I wanna talk about purity, and obviously this is an overview of transformation, so um, we will continue in the details of grace and things of that nature as we go forward. But this is something that we base the Christian and the foundation of Christian life on. Uh, a couple things. Faith in Christ is foundational. Scriptures are foundational. But in, in addition to believing in Christ and believing what happens through our belief, I want to talk about more about what happens after our belief, and that is becoming. So... Uh, Jesus did not just call us to believe in him alone, but he actually called us to become like him. Jesus wants us to follow after him, not just looking at Jesus. And a lot of people look at Jesus. I mean, they, they did it in his day. I mean, they looked at him healing. Look at that Jesus. He's amazing. You see him healing people? They saw him setting people free. Oh, man, Jesus is awesome. He sets people free. 
They saw Jesus uh, uh, caring for, for the lowest of the low. They saw Jesus stopping for the one. They, and they're like, man, that Jesus is just so kind. Look what he does for all these people. So we, we watch him and we look at him and we see him, but he's not saying to just watch me. He's saying, follow me. And following Jesus means that you are also now taking on the life of Christ, that you're actually putting on Christ. And so in, in addition to belief, we need to become more like our Lord. And there's a universal call to Christian life, to holiness. Let's go to 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16. Oh boy, Jesus help me. I got a few verses here. I'm gonna go a little quicker because these are recorded. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. So it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. See, God calls us to holiness because he is holy himself. And since he is holy, we need to be holy. This is Gospel 101. Hebrews 12, 12 through 14. Therefore, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone, and listen to this, and for the holiness without which no one will see uh, the Lord. So without holiness, essentially we will not be able to see the Lord without the work of God inside of us. And what is holiness? Another word for holiness, a description for it could be sanctification. This is the sanctification process. Yes, you have been justified. Yes, you are a born again, believing uh, son or daughter of God. And, and, and nothing's gonna take that away. Your belief in him, he's, he's got you. You're, you're his, you're adopted. But there's also, through the Holy Spirit, a sanctification process that needs to take place so that we can grow and that we can mature in the Lord. Imagine having a child Grow up, and maybe, and, and I know personal, you know, people, friends, and, and some family members that you have a child and they get older, but they never grow up. It's like some people are like, I've been a believer for 15 years. But your immaturity, your, your unsanctification, you, you haven't subscribed to the sanctification process. And so because of that, you're still struggling with stuff that, that should have been taken care of early in your Christian walk. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3 and verse 8 says this. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. He's, he's identifying that. And he says, therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gives us his Holy Spirit to you. This is the, a lot of people ask you, especially as a pastor, maybe you ask yourself all the time, what is the will of God for my life? God, what, what, what is your will for me? What do you want, what do you, what's your will for me? I need to know, what's, hey, look at me, do you see, do you see God's will for my life? Like, they'll, they'll go to extraordinary measures to see the, God's will for their life, and I just want you to, I just want to set it straight. Just if you were ever wondering, what is God's will for my life? His will is for you to be holy. It's his will. Are you living a holy life? Are you living a sanctified life? Not just for the pastors. It's for you too, all believers. And by the way, pastors don't get a pass because they're pastors. I gotta go through the sanctification process too. And there needs to be fruit of that. So to reject holiness is to resist God. Again, I've said it before, holiness is not legalism. Holiness is God's will for us. We are resisting the Holy Spirit when we resist God's holiness. The Holy Spirit who's given to us. Well, now there's justification, which we talked about, and sanctification, and just like the natural versus the supernatural, babies grow up in the natural, and so we should grow up in the supernatural. We don't expect the same of a five-year-old as a one-year-old. We don't expect the same as a 
five-year-old as a 15-year-old or a 25-year-old versus a 15-year-old. We expect obedience and good behavior, but what else do we expect? Maturity. Not everyone can drive a car just because you hit that age. You need to mature to be able to handle a car. Or some people got a car and got more immature. I don't know, but, but and Albuquerque is not a great example of good drivers. You guys are awesome drivers, but everyone else here is just red light runners or something. I don't understand it, but I, I, like, I look both ways while going through a green light. Um, it's a good habit. But it can be painful to grow up. Growing up is painful. Why? It makes us uh, uh, understand work. It makes us understand how to toil, understand the process of character. Turn to your neighbor and say, trust the process. Any basketball fans here? Jo- Joel Embiid, right? He's a Philadelphia 76ers uh, star, and he's an amazing basketball player. And, and, and every, all the Sixer fans are wanting a world championship. And, uh, and, and he's famous for telling the Sixers fans, just trust the process. No? Yeah, it's 10 years, but it's still happening. It's... <laughs> or better yet, love the process, submit to the process. Maturity is the goal here. Holiness and sanctification, justification with maturity. If we don't grow up, we can't receive the good things God has for us. It's almost like the more you steward, the more grace that's extended to you. And you find that these things come even easier and easier. Matthew 5, 8 says this, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It's a great verse. It's during the uh, Sermon on the Mount. He says this, uh, C.S. Lewis says this, it is safe to tell, it's a quote from C.S. Lewis, my favorite, it's a safe to tell the pure in heart that they shall see God, for only the pure in heart want to. See, there is no darkness in God. The Apostle John tells us this, that he is purely light. And so there is no darkness. There is no evil in him. And so if you want to be fully refined by God to be in a perfect relationship with the Lord, be pure in heart and understand this. I can't have these issues in my heart going on while I'm still trying to uh, uh, say that I'm sanctified or that I'm being holy. Now, many of you might say, well, listen, Paul, I don't, I don't, I'm not an alcoholic, I don't do drugs, I, I don't cheat on my wife, and, and I don't look at porn, and, and you know, you might say all the, you know, you might know all the major sins, but do you gossip? Do you look at people and judge them so well that you don't even think you can see God's redemption in there? Is there other immaturity things happening? Are you seeing everything through your own physical lens or or are you seeing it through the likeness of Christ going, wow, even that horrible situation, God's redemption could be in there. Now, many of you might still be struggling with some major sins and you haven't been able to get free from those. I just want you to know there is so much hope in Jesus to get free. Not just a behavior, not just to change your behavior for moments and fall. I'm talking about getting actually set free. And now, and 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 you might still be tempted, but that temptation doesn't make you succumb anymore. You have the power to say no. First Corinthians 11:1. 1, it says this: "Be imitators of me, as I am of Christ." We want to follow the leading of what, of what Christ looks like. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, such an amazing disciple of Jesus, was saying, look, look, I'm centered after Christ, so follow me. Do, do what I'm doing. Be an imitator of what I'm doing. Romans 12, 2. 
It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. See, the world wants you to conform into their box. The world doesn't want you to change. The world wants everything to be status quo and everything to be good in their eyes. And God's saying, don't conform to what the world is trying to do in your life, but instead, be transformed. This word transformed is metamorpho. The, the base Greek word that we use in English is what, is what that word transformed is, is, is translated. Where do we get that word metamorpho? We use that word in English for metamorphosis. The caterpillar changes into a butterfly. Similarly to the Christian life that Jesus wants for us. We are transformed. We are actually new creations in Christ Jesus. How am I being, tra and I want us to ask this question. Am I being transformed? Am I the same person now that I was five years ago? What's the difference between my old self and my new self? 2 Corinthians 3, 18. This is one of my favorite. It's actually one of Ruth's favorite verses too. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. You wanna continually be transformed continue to look into his glory because you can't help but be transformed as you're looking into his glory. Now, some of you might say, Paul, you're asking me to be perfect. Only God is perfect. And you're absolutely right. You will never be like your heavenly father in perfection. Only through the righteousness of Christ do we receive the perfection of being blameless before him. However, I don't think that we need to try to attain to be God. That's not the goal, but it is to be perfectly human. You should be the exact way that God originally intended you to be. It's like saying, this is a, if I say that this is a perfect laptop, I'm not saying that this laptop is becoming like God. I'm saying this laptop is working perfectly as a laptop. And you, as a believer in Christ, can reach a perfection through sanctification, not in terms of never sinning ever again, but actually being transformed into his glory. And believe me, you will always be a working progress until you meet him again, okay? But, but there is a, a, a state of being that you can attain by being in Christ, being transformed by his glory, where things will be broken off of you. How is this happening? Through grace. God has ordained that grace is the means by which we become holy. You're not in this alone, and you don't have to do it alone, because he's extended grace to you. The source of all grace is God, the Holy Spirit. The Nicene Creed calls the Holy Spirit the giver of all life. That, that word life, uh, 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 pneuma, which is the Holy Spirit, pneumatology, uh, the study of the Holy Spirit, pneuma literally means breath. The same breath that was breathed into Adam is the same breath that is breathing grace into your life. Yeah. Hebrews 10.29 talks about the spirit of grace calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of grace. Titus 3, 4 and 5. We're almost done here, guys. Thank you for holding on. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's with you. 
to walk with you, to journey with you, to help you in your decisions, to help you in your freedom, to, 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 to make these small little choices every day that starts to journey you closer and closer to the Lord in your sanctification process. And you start leaving some old things behind you that are no longer chasing you down. This idea of virtue can be attained again. I think virtue is something that we've kind of given up on in society. But virtue is so good. You know, uh, uh, that guy, um, Sullenberger, the pilot, he wasn't born a pilot. He needed, he, he needed to learn a skill set. And he learned it so well, actually, he learned it so much in the military that really crossed over with this particular plane. And he was so, I, I, I believe, even the Holy Spirit bringing stuff to him, but he was so safety concerned and safety driven that when every other pilot was given the same scenario in a flight simulator, when they were doing the testing for it, all of them failed except for him, except for the original flight. None of them could do what he had done in that short period of time. All of them crashed. Now, if we were trying to look at the manual, you know, if you're like, well, if you put me in there, I could figure it out, right? <laughs> but it's like, maybe, I mean, I YouTube everything, right? I'm sure it's on YouTube, right? But, but, may, but, but think about it, you'd have to look at the book, you'd have to look at the index, oh, what's this sensor mean, what's that mean? You know, there is no time. It's all on recall over thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of practice that brought in so that when, when it happened, it was second nature to him. Not first nature where it was fully conscious, second nature, unconsciously knew how to operate everything perfectly. Why don't you stand? I wanna encourage you this morning that freedom, sanctification, development of your spiritual life with Jesus is so full of hope and he continually wants to work with us. And I'm just so grateful that Jesus doesn't relate to us right now in our dysfunction. See, there's nothing you could do to make Jesus love you more, which absolutely means that there's nothing you can do to make Jesus love you less. Right? He, he fully loves you. It's not conditional. It's called unconditional love. You're his son. You're his creation. He, you were a thought in his mind before he, you were never, ever a thought in your parents' mind. He loves you so much. But he wants to see you free. He wants to see you whole. If you had a child and you saw him drinking poison, a little poison every day, who was, who was aging but not growing up, make your heart sad. And as a parent, you would say, man, there's so much more for you. Daughter, there's so much more for you. I want you to live a better life. I want you to be set free. You're in my house, but now you gotta, you, you gotta tra be transformed. Imitate me. Take on everything that I've given. I have so much grace for you to take a hold of this freedom. So I'm gonna to ask today that the Holy Spirit touch you, that he would uh, convict you. Oh, that's a fun word, right? Look, I get convicted all the time. If he's convicting me this much, you get some too, all right? I'm just far from perfect. But I pray that he convicts you and just things you didn't even realize where God's like, man, Paul, you could grow up a little bit in this area. So Holy Spirit, I just pray right now that you would show us that you would convict us and, set, and show us where we need to just surrender things, where we need to grow up, where we need to mature, where we need sanctification in every area of our life. Because we wanna be holy as you are holy. We wanna be pure in heart. We wanna seek you constantly, God. We wanna look into your glory and be transformed by you. Because what we look at, we become. We don't wanna just have a belief system. We wanna go beyond the belief system and, and holding on to our beliefs, start becoming. So Jesus, I pray that as you bring these things to our mind, 
that at the same moment, you would extend grace. Grace to live a discipline, a spiritually disciplined life. Grace to not gossip. Grace to not do those horrible things that we know are wrong, but also grace to do things different and we didn't realize they were wrong, Lord. Just, we just ask for grace. If we struggle with anger, if we struggle with anxiety, if we struggle with fear, worry, doubt, would you extend your grace, Holy Spirit, and walk with us as we watch you overcome everything time and time again. In Jesus' name, amen. I wanna invite our prayer team and anyone who uh, has been on our ministry team to come forward. If you are wanting someone to walk with you through something, you want prayer about something, uh, please come and, uh, and we wanna pray with you. If, even if it's just breakthrough in a certain area that wasn't discussed today, uh, it could be anything. Just come, we pray with you and watch Jesus do amazing things. So other than that, bless you guys. May God be with you throughout this week. We love you and uh, we will see you next week.